on your Alexa-powered smart speaker and on TuneIn, iHeart, and on Odyssey. Now, from the Signature Bank Studios, this is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan, and in for Amy J. Today is Charles Thomas, former ABC7 political reporter. It's been a wonderful morning. It has as been. Usual. It has been. And uh, Charles, um, the uh, sainted Ibram Kendi is uh, the, at the center of some controversy. Uh, Ibram Kendi, his real name is uh, Henry Rogers. <laughs> uh huh. Um, and Ibram I, Kendi sounds better. Yeah, it does. I think that's why. Bobby Moore went with Ahmad Rashad. You know, it's the same, same reason. Bobby Moore. Yeah. Oregon, Oregon State. Yeah. Oregon? Yeah. 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 Uh, so Ibram Kendi uh, rose to fame, as I think anybody listening to this show would know. Over the last several years, he wrote the book How to Be an Anti-Racist, and then he got uh, a deal to write How to Be an Anti-Racist Baby or Anti-Racist Baby. Then he got a Netflix series. Then he... Got the sinecure at Boston University where they set up the Center for Anti-Racist Research. <laughs> That's robust. Uh, he is, um, uh, and then, you know, so then it's in uh, all of the uh, core curricula in corporate America for their diversity, their diet training seminars uh, for K-12 through education, of course, uh, giving lectures at universities, never doing interviews or debates with uh, anybody who is, does not subscribe to his beliefs, which are nicely summed up as the only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. And in order to be truly anti-racist, you also have to be anti-capitalist. So in sum, in order to not be a racist, you have to be a racist Marxist. Hmm. Okay, they need that center to try to work the logic of that. Well, that center is um, under some scrutiny uh, it was announced that he has to lay off, that he did, and he didn't have to. I guess he had to because he did it. Lay off half of his staff. I don't know how many that number is. And also, some Boston University professors are making statements that suggest some sort of malfeasance. Philip or Philippe Copeland, who's a professor at Boston University School of Social Work, the organization was just being mismanaged on a really fundamental level. A uh, BU professor who worked at the center for a year. I don't know where the money is. Hmm. In 2021, the same BU professor sent an email to the provost alleging dysfunction and, quote, a pattern of amassing grants without any commitment to producing the research obligated by them. <laughs> what do you What do you think, Charles? Well, this is a cottage industry. I mean, you know, it's an industry that, that's grown up for decades, and it got a real boost in 2020 with the George Floyd situation. Uh, but the industry is built on a false or at least declining, certainly a business model that's in decline because to have this Center for Anti-Race Studies or whatever it's called, you got to have racism. You got to have a lot of it. You got to have it. So they've got to go out and look for it wherever it is. And then they have to come up with the term systemic racism, which is the, the which is what most of the, these people talk about. And to me, it's an insult to what my father and grandfather, two men who I knew, who really were up against systemic racism. Right. And when these people come up with it. You wonder, well, what are you talking about? Well, here, here the thing, too, is you could do real research in this sort of general area of race relations, the impact of particular public policies on particular uh, cohorts within uh, a, a diverse society like America and compare and contrast. You can do all that stuff. But they just there's just no interest in doing that because they're here to push a particular political ideology they're not there to do academic studies particularly anything that might go against their ideology and prescriptions for societal harmony i mean it's like 
you know, like Roland Fryer, he's a real researcher. He's a real economist at at uh, at Harvard. And when he looks at sort of, you know, the incidence of 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 uh, uh, he looks at crime, for example, and he he looks at the incidence of black uh, of, of, of of black men being shot by white police officers, and just that whole conversation about police shootings and so on and so forth. And he comes to conclusions that he, he didn't suspect he would come to. And then he explains his methodology and what I thought going in and what I understand from distilling the data. Well, that's a researcher. That's doing research work. But that, that's not what these flim flammers are interested in, starting with Ibram Kendi, who was right there with Ta-Nehisi Coates and among the leading flim flammers of the 21st century. For more on all this, we're pleased to be joined again by Will Riley. He's the Associate Professor of Poli Sci at Kentucky State University, author of the book Hate Crime Hoax, how the left is selling a fake race war. Will, thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. Yeah, glad to be back on the show. So, Good morning, Dr. Riley. Uh, Good morning. We only call medical doctors doctors on the show. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, all right. Sorry. You're just Professor Riley. We'll accept that. Um, all right, so, uh, Will, uh, your uh, uh, surprise at what's uh, going on at Boston University. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not really surprised by this at all. So the the Center for Anti Racist Research is, uh, I mean, sort of a grift that's been going on for a couple of years now. I mean, this is what Jack Dorsey from Twitter gave ten million dollars to. I think they've received. Yes, yeah, right. That's um, right. Yeah, it's forty three million dollars total, and the idea was that they were going to produce. Uh, brand new research showing that I guess there's racism in America. They had a really broad uh, mission, and they didn't really do any of that. I mean, they put together a website, and they put out a series of articles with the local paper. I think it's the Boston Globe. I don't really keep track of what's going on in Boston, other than the occasional sporting event, but that's it. And right now, they, they seem to have burnt through all the money. So the the thirty million, the two figures I've heard, thirty one million, forty three million, that seems to be almost all gone. So right now they're just running on an annual budget, and so half of the staff, which I think was fifty five people, has been laid off right now. And uh, there's, there's not much more to say about that. You know, the United States is not an epidemically racist country, so the entire kind of BLM hustle was never going to produce all that much. I mean, I think to some extent it showed the goodwill of both white Americans and the black upper middle class and that money and time really, really flowed to this stuff. I mean, to BLM itself, you know, Nicole Hannah-Jones 1619 project. Remember, there was quite a lot of this, like oh, the yeah. Howard Zinn sort of Marxist leaning curriculum, the, the anti-racist research center and so on. But we didn't really see anything come out of that 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 told us anything about the USA that we didn't know. So I guess – you know, RIP the center. That that's pretty much it. They didn't they didn't enlighten us. You know, I I, I heard a quote the other night. It was from uh, Jason Whitlock, who's a an okay. author, you know, yeah, an fearless author. podcast. And, yeah, yeah. He, he this is his quote. He I think he summed it up in ten seconds. Quote: Black elites are the true face of white supremacy. They have no interest in ending oppression. They want to benefit from it. Yeah, well, well, I I do think there's kind of a devil's bargain between the elites in white and minority communities as a guy who's been an executive in higher education. I mean, if you look at most colleges, you have legacy programs, which are frankly for dumb white kids. I mean, if if your grandfather went to the (laughs) University of Mississippi, you're probably a white guy who's not, you know, killing it on the test. But in exchange for that not being challenged until quite recently – you have at least as sweeping uh, kind of diversity forward programs. They're usually called um, affirmative action admissions, minority scholarships, so on down the line. And obviously, you know, contra the systemic racism argument, it's a huge advantage to be a black or Hispanic or Native American student when you're applying to college to the extent that, as Ibram Kendi himself has noted, about a third of white kids are now lying about their ethnic background, magically becoming Cherokee and this kind of thing. So... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that those two groups of elites are, are very comfortable with the current status quo. Um, that, there's not that much more to say about that. The, the root issue here is that there's not – so there's the big problem in the black community, to kind of switch tracks a little bit, isn't racism in 2023. 
there are a lot of issues that deal with either culture, a lot of which are shared with poor whites, by the way, as the great Tom Sowell has noted, or that deal with maybe past racism 100 years ago. But you're talking about fatherlessness. Uh, you're talking about gun violence. I mean, the murder rate in the USA is over 20,000 per year. That's half African-American, which is crazy. We're about 15 percent of the population. You know, drugs, and that's very much shared with the working class white community. ODs were over 100,000 last year. So there are all these real issues. But those don't tie into that kind of network of elite organizations that exist. I mean, the NAACP has been around, sometimes does good work for 100 plus years. And now you have all this BLM stuff. I mean, whatever Al Sharpton is, National Action Network. You know, Jesse Jackson right there in Chicago has never gone away. Rainbow Push. This this whole the kind of massive enterprise is dedicated to looking at racism. So when people come along, and I'll sometimes do this, Dr. Fryer certainly does this, um, and say, well, no, that's not the problem. That hasn't been the problem for 50 years. There, there's a real incentive to to minimize that. So that that's how you get a center – focused entirely on looking for like new exotic forms of racism and what you end up generally when you do that is you you spend a lot of money and you don't find anything we we know what racism is and there's less of it than there was in 1970 well and it seems to me and by the way you know this is a point that charles emphasizes too what you just said about you know yeah, yeah. essentially poor what poor and Tom, thomas soul as well as for charles thomas here uh poor whites and and urban blacks have a lot in common um, so it seems to me then we're we're all sort of dancing around the riddle that has yet to be solved, which is how do we deprogram white suburban dilettantes and uh, black, uh, you know, b- b- black families that are centered in, in in urban areas, so that they see that they're, there's just a, there's a scam being run on them. Well, I I think you have to tell the truth. To some extent. I mean, like one of the things that I find as a professional researcher is that perspectives in America are shaped by a lot of incredibly false knowledge. So when people say when people mention like the lived experiences of black people or the real feelings of black people, it is actually true that a lot of black Americans feel they're oppressed or feel they're suffering. Mm -hmm. But that's often based on things that everyone knows that kind of just aren't true. So, I mean, there, there's a very famous study from the Skeptic Research Center, came out, I think, two years back now, where they interviewed thousands of black men and urban white liberals. And they asked both groups, how many unarmed, specifically black men, do you think are shot annually by the police? The real number, by the way, is like 12. And the average answer was around 10,000. <laughs> right. Because of the coverage. I mean, was, right. Yeah, I mean, it was well. Ten thousand is a slight exaggeration. It was like thirty or forty percent thought it was about a thousand, and then like twenty percent or a little less thought it was about ten thousand, and then ten percent thought it was more than that. So the average would have been like a couple of thousand. But I mean, it was it was two orders of magnitude above reality. So it's it's because of things like this that people are constantly afraid, constantly angry, and this pattern, by the way, extends throughout society, and every group has some version of it. Like if you're looking at middle class white women, by the way, who are the most scared group, you find similarly crazy stuff. Like in 2021, like one year into the pandemic, quote unquote, like the average white American woman thought 9 percent of the population was already dead. Yeah. Right. So what, what do you do about that? I mean, I think I people with platforms, including all three of us, um, as a first step, have to just start telling the truth. Like there are a lot of things from you can't change your sex, for example. But um, and there are, there are only two sexes, but that is a different conversation. It's, it's, there are a lot of things. It, there are a lot of things like the biggest problem in the black community is crime, or single motherhood isn't good. Like individual single moms hustle hard, but the stats just are what they are. That are really obviously true. Marriage is good, but that are presented as very controversial and that people shy away from. And it's important to say those things. Like when you look at a city like Baltimore. Or for that matter, a city like Chicago or a city like Louisville here in Kentucky, where the percentage of kids reading at grade level is like six, shunting that away and pretending it's due to some obscure form of racism, that's not helping anybody. So step one is is kind of use the platform to convey reality, which which I think you guys do, but which society in general needs to start doing. Like when you mentioned the the typical working class mom or something, they don't know what reality is. Well, and and I, I tell you, it's, it's almost like you need to get uh, I don't know, not not all 330 million Americans, but uh, a good percentage of them 
and run them through Robert Kleck's uh, SCAR experiment, the Dartmouth professor. This is like a probably 30 years old now, um, where uh, he put uh, scars on people's faces and said, okay, we're going to go out and they want you to sort of record people's reaction to you and so on and so forth. And right before they went out to interact with other people and you know, record their impressions of how people treated them, they erased the makeup ing that presented the scars. So they had no scars on their face. They went out, they interacted with uh, people. They came back and said, oh, I was treated as less than because, you know, I had the scar on my face. So they, they were looking at me askew. He, my, he, his eyes were darting around me, didn't want to look at me, and so on and so forth. But because they were programmed to, to uh, believe they were going to be treated a certain way. And so no matter how they actually were treated, they had that impression in their mind. And that's sort of what we see, some of the psychosis we see happening uh, along racial lines and, and other lines as well. Yeah, I think that's actually, that's actually really true. And to give an example, like in one of my larger classes every year, I ask people anonymously, how many negative experiences with other people do you feel you have in a month? You know, maybe a scuffle or a fist fight for college men at the very worst, but like a glare in traffic, you know, um, you know, a rude interaction at the store and so on down the line. One. And two, how many of those do you attribute specifically to racism? And my black students and my Appalachian students have almost exactly the same number of negative encounters. It's like 0.5 more for the black kids. It's like 14 versus 14 and a half. But they attribute about half of them to racism. And these are like good, normal taxpaying citizens. You know, it's just that there, there's been this background noise throughout their entire lives about even though your girlfriend may be Caucasian, even though you live in this well-integrated city and this pleasant rural state, there must be this prejudice out there somewhere. So it's very tempting that when a cop stops you and is a little rude and he's giving you a ticket, for example, for you not to think, oh, this guy's having a bad day or even this, this guy's a jackass, but this guy's a racist. So you, you have this weird situation where black and white people, maybe there is a little racism, maybe that's the point five, but have almost identical lives, but where the black guy is going to be very tempted to say, a lot of the negativity in my life is due to prejudice. Why'd she break up with me? She's a racist. Why'd he deny that loan? Racism. Like, you can use what's called a list experiment to find residual racism. It's like a 2 or 3% effect. But that, that's not what people think they're seeing when they watch the George Floyd or the Jacob Blake video. They, people think this is Nazi Germany, and it, it's not. <laughs> I mean, it's, right. it's not. Right. We measure it. Will Riley, Associate Professor of Poli Sci, Kentucky State University, his book, Hate Crime Hoax, How the Left is Selling a Fake Race War. Will, thanks as always for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And he joined us on the Turnkey Dot Provincial Line. It's news, opinion, insight. This is Chicago's Morning Answer on AM560.